I can honestly admit that what I'm doing now, standing in front of this awesome audience, giving a TED Talk, is completely out of my comfort zone. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to freak out or anything. So, uh, <laughs> And you may be thinking to yourself that you're a professional soccer player. You must be used to performing in front of thousands of people on the weekends in some pretty big games. That's all true. However, I'm used to performing with a ball at my feet and about 100 yards of space to run into. Now, I have no ball and nowhere to run. I could try to run laps to the audience, but I definitely would trip and fall. <laughs> so I'm just going to go, go ahead and get right into it. I make $18,000 a year doing what I love. That's not a joke, but you can feel free to laugh. I laugh at myself all the time because of it. It's definitely a niche sport with absolutely no job security, and stability doesn't exist. Forget the Tom Brady's and the Peyton Mannings. I do not have the luxury house, and I definitely don't have the Ferrari. Uh, we're more like the players living in your basement because we can't afford our own apartment. But the funny thing is, I feel like I have the life of a millionaire. To me, I have everything. I am rich beyond measure. I have players coming to my games who want my autograph, who ask for my picture. And shockingly, these young players aspire to be me. Yes, me. And to me, that is priceless. So as I stand here today talking to you guys, I want to let you know how I became one of the professional athletes that you've probably never heard of. <laughs> the story is quite uncomfortable and quite awkward, but it's a story I definitely definitely need to share today. When I was 22 years old, I was coming out of college. And I was expecting to go straight into the college US professional draft. And as I was debating on what my draft status would be, all of a sudden, uh, since I was so busy debating about my draft status, our league went bankrupt, belly up. So plan A turned into plan B. and. As I thought to myself, you know, what, what's going to happen in my life? What am I getting myself into? I quickly learned that I was taking a class no college could ever offer. It was a PhD in women's soccer. The journey started in Sweden. Since I couldn't enter a US pro draft, I went straight to Sweden and signed a contract. The contract was a difficult one because I was coming off of back surgery. I was about 24 years old. And I had a pretty difficult time in one game where I had a violent twist and I severely damaged my back. I went to surgery immediately, but I walked out of that surgery the same day and made it a point to get comfortable with lower back discomfort. And for all of my life, I've been different. Ever since I was a little girl, <laughs> I hated wearing dresses. I hated the color pink. And for all of my youth, I would wear my hair down. And it wouldn't matter how hot of a day was. It could be 98 degrees with 100% humidity. And all of my teammates and friends would plead for me to please put your hair up, and I wouldn't. I would wear it down. Because I learned from a very young age that it was OK to be different. And I would get stared at a lot. I'd play with the boys. I was often better than the boys, and I would get stared at. And it was definitely awkward, but it was something that I just adjusted to and got used to. And I learned that I had to sacrifice a lot to achieve my dreams. I had to sacrifice time with friends. I had to sacrifice social events. And I had to sacrifice family functions. I just couldn't make the popular decision. I had to practice. And because of this, my ability and desire to step outside of my comfort zone only grew from once I graduated from Penn State. So when I hit the ground in Sweden, I was okay. I didn't speak a word of Swedish, and my back injury was pretty bad. I still attempted to try to get onto the field to play in practices and games, but every time I stepped off the field, I felt like I got hit by a bus. So I had to adjust. And the pain and emotional discomfort was very difficult. I could have easily taken the first flight back home, but I didn't. 
I transform this opportunity, one with physical discomfort and emotional discomfort, into a chance to live abroad and truly find myself. The PhD in women's soccer showed me that I would have to push my physical limits. And I would have to be okay <clears throat> living in a foreign country under some very difficult circumstances. And I loved it and I wanted more. So fast forward a few years. I was coming off an extremely disappointing season. Uh, my butt was still sore from sitting on the bench for so much of that season. And I had to figure out a way to get better. So I researched the best training environments in the world. And all sources pointed to Tokyo, Japan. So I picked up my passport and I said, I'm going to Tokyo. I slept on a five inch thick futon, a 25 story high rise apartment in downtown Tokyo on a hardwood floor. It was pretty uncomfortable. I lived with the agent of one of my Japanese teammates and I didn't know him very well. He was a very nice guy. What I did know is that training was an hour away. I had to catch a variety of trains and buses to get to practice at a remote location and train under a coach who didn't speak a lick of English. So essentially, I ran around like a chicken with her head cut off. I was easily the worst player at training every single day. And to me, that was really disappointing because I had prided myself for decades, really, on my soccer skills. And these girls were literally running circles around me. So all I could do was keep my head down, work hard, and gain respect by learning the language. And as they say, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So I copied their every move, their brilliance on the ball, and their industrious worth ethic. And there were definitely some silly moments along the way. I would catch the wrong train, I would say the wrong thing, something stupid, and I would completely mess up the drill at training. But after the three months, the girls were close friends, the language was manageable, and the sushi tasted great. <laughs> and I proved to myself, most importantly, that I could put myself in a vulnerable position in a strange place to get better. And get better I did. I returned from Japan um, into a new US pro league and I was, I was like an animal out of a cage. I was hungry. I had my best season as a pro and I was wrapped up and of course our league folded again. So uh, you just got used to that. As I, I said again, uh, job security wasn't really an option in our league. So our league folded again. I was 29 years old. A lot of players at that point would retire. And I thought to myself, I can't retire. I love what I do. I do what I love. So I had to figure out somewhere and somehow for the show to go on. What better place than soccer-obsessed Barcelona, Spain? So I got on a plane and I flew into Barcelona. Amazing city, horrible economy. I went three months without getting paid a single cent. And my landlord, worst yet, went three months without getting paid a single cent in rent. So eventually, I got a paycheck, but my landlord never did, and I was evicted. And I was evicted over the winter break when I'd already planned a trip to go to India to work with an NGO that uses soccer for social change. And we had already decided with the club that I would miss four games in the beginning part of the season, the second part of the season once winter break was over. They said it was okay, so off I went to India. If I thought Spain was difficult, it was nothing compared to India. We lived in the northeast part of the country for 10 days. It was January. It was cold. There were no warm showers, uh, absolutely no heat, and hard beds with few blankets. I was a short-haired white woman, as you can see, that stuck out like a sore thumb. And in India, it's not rude to stare. So the stares would come frequently. They would come often, sometimes scary, sometimes funny, depending on what mood we were in that day. But they were a constant occurrence. Everything felt unfamiliar to us. The people, the hygiene, the culture. The only thing that felt natural was soccer. And every time we stepped on the field, we would coach over 200 girls for about four hours a day. That was the only time we felt normal. Soccer was the game that we loved. It was the game the girls loved. And it truly was our universal language. And I thought to myself, once India was over, would I go back again? I traveled halfway around the world and I froze, I starved. I hit my exhaustion point. 
and I would do it all over again. And I asked myself, why? For two reasons. Because adversity builds character, and doing what you love requires sacrifice. And I did go back exactly one year later, and it wasn't any more comfortable, but it really opened up my eyes to the complexities of life and the simple ways that I could make a difference. So if we rewind, I'm just finishing up my first trip in India and it's time to head back to Spain. So I get on the flight, I head back to Spain. I don't really know what I'm going home to. I don't know where I'm living. I'm hoping that all my stuff is somewhere in boxes. And I get back and I'm in a new apartment. I'm living with about five of my teammates in a crowded uh, four bedroom apartment in downtown Barcelona. And the coach has the bright idea of putting me right back onto the field. You're, Joe, you're gonna start. It didn't go too well, and it didn't make me any new friends. And these are the same friends that I'd be living with for the next three months, so you can imagine how awkward it was trying to finish out that contract, but I did. It took stamina and perseverance, and I got to learn a bit of Spanish. I honestly could go on with stories like this for hours. I'm 31 years old. I've felt the high of victory and the devastating low of defeat. I play in a league that most people doesn't even know exists. You, know, you can feel free to nudge the person next to you and fully admit that you had no idea there was even a league, let alone a team in your backyard. And it's okay because we're used to it. It's just part of our job. But the amazing thing is, is that it's not about the money and it's not about the paycheck and it's not about the fame or the fortune. It's really about what you get from your sport. Mm -hmm. I've been the star player, the player that everyone loves and adores, and I've been the bench player that struggles to get just one minute on the field. And while I've enjoyed all of my successes, it's the periods of struggle that I'm really proud of. It's the periods where I've been knocked down, where people have said no, where I've been cut, where I've been forced to just figure something out because the league has folded. That's what I'm really proud of. All the scrapes, bumps, bruises, and scars have truly defined who I am. It's absolutely been a truly uncomfortable roller coaster ride to the top. It's been unpredictable. It's been unstable. It's been really hard at times, but it's a ride that I don't ever want to get off of. I finally have earned my PhD, and now this is the only way I know how to live.